There are some things that we give them because we love them, not tied to their deeds, but tied to our love. And we serve a God that loves us so much that he gives us some things that are not tied to our deeds, that are not tied to our behavior, but tied to his love. Praise the Lord, Alfred Street. Praise the Lord, Alfred Street. The Bible, in fact, declares, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. For truly God is great and greatly to be praised. I don't take it lightly this morning that I have the privilege and the blessed favor to stand before you. Thank you, Pastor Wesley, for lending your pulpit and your people that I might practice the craft of preaching on this morning. I'm grateful to be in the house. I'm grateful to be with family, and I'm grateful for each and every one of you. Let us pray. Almighty and all-wise God, we thank you, O oh God, that you have gathered us in your house, that we're assembled in your presence, that we might hear what thus saith the Lord. God, I don't know what my neighbor is going through, God. I don't know what the week was that they've come through, God. But I know, O oh Lord, that if they know you like, and need you like I need you, O oh God, we need you to show up in this place on today. So God, do whatever it is that you have to do so that we can have ourselves in your fellowship this morning. Do whatever it is that you have to do, oh God, that we can give you our praise. Do whatever you have to do this morning, oh God, that we can leave this place having a changed life. And so God, if you do that, we would be pleased and give you name all the praise, honor, and glory. And it's in the name of Jesus that we ask these blessings. And the people of God said, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles with, this, with me this morning and can turn to the gospel according to Luke, the Gospel according to Luke, the first chapter, beginning at the fifth verse, I invite you to rise if you are able for the reading of God's holy word. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 reads thusly. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him to the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me 
to take away my reproach among the people. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For the time that is ours this morning, I want to preach from the subject, delivered. Let the church say delivered. There is an adage that says that confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. And at the risk of my reputation, I need to confess this morning that I have a pet peeve for punctuality. I like it when people show up on time. I like it when things get delivered right away. And of all the things I enjoy most, nothing is as good to me as Amazon Prime delivery. That's a blessing in my soul. I like Prime. Because it doesn't matter what it is, if it's in stock, you can have it at your door. With one click, same day delivery. I like Amazon Prime because I get an early access to deals, exclusives others have to wait to see. But what I love most about Amazon Prime is better than the exclusive deals, better than early access. What I love most about Amazon Prime is that whatever you want, have it delivered to your door. If I could afford it, I'd have stock in Amazon right now because they deliver like I like it. I don't have to wait, church. I can request it today and receive it tomorrow. And because I have that access, sometimes I forget that everything in the world doesn't always work so quickly. What I've learned is that it's easy to become frustrated when what you've requested gets delayed in delivery. If that's you this morning, tiptoe with me as we meet a brother by the name of Zacharias who meets an angel trying to deliver him a word from the Gospel of Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one is an appropriate place for us to begin our journey in Advent as it is the foretelling birth of John. Luke records the story of a husband and a wife named Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias holds the position of being a priest. And Elizabeth is not only his wife, she holds the position of being one of the daughters of Aaron. The Bible says that both of them are righteous and blameless, yet they have not received the blessing for which they have prayed, the blessing of a child. I'm not certain what Zacharias prayed for. Was it for a son? Was it that he'd be healthy? Was it that his life would have significance? I'm not sure about how long he prayed or for what he asked, but based on the text this morning, it was a repeated prayer that seemed as if there was no response. A repeated prayer that got lost in the email of the Lord. A repeated prayer that tested their ability to hold on to hope. When we meet Zacharias in the text, he's prayed so long that he's going through the motions of ministry but can't see movement in his circumstance. Going through the motions, keeping busy as the priest, but not alert to the fact that God was still moving in his situation. He's righteous without a reward. He's caught in the ritual of a routine and can't find much hope that God will help his situation. And my Bible readers will note this morning that this is not the first time we've seen this familiar pattern found in Luke chapter 1, where an angel appeared, the response was fear, a divine announcement was made, an objection was given, and a sign is offered to guarantee the announcement. I'll run it back so you can get it again. This isn't the first time we've seen this pattern, that an angel appeared, the response was fear, a divine announcement was made, an objection was given, and a sign is offered to guarantee the announcement. This angelophany, let the church say angelophany, is the appearance of an angel sent on assignment to tap someone on the shoulder to let them know that God's still working in your situation. It's in this angelophany that God sends three tweets that I'm going to share with you this morning to help Zacharias hold on to a little bit of hope. Tweet one, God hears and he handles. 
God hears and he handles. The Bible says that Zacharias and Elizabeth are righteous, meaning in right relationship with God. Yet they have not heard a response to their request and silently ask, God, are you talking? They're righteous, yet they have no reward. They wanted a son. They're righteous, yet they have to deal with the reality that God doesn't always do it on my time. And yet, because Zacharias is righteous, he still has a requirement to go to work. He still has a requirement to serve in the temple. Even when he hasn't seen God work on his behalf, he's righteous, still with the responsibility to serve the people. He's righteous. Yet he has to recognize that he's delayed by God. Zacharias' righteousness isn't remarkable to God. It's what's required. He's the priest. He serves God's people. He intercedes on their behalf. That's what he's supposed to do. His righteousness is not remarkable. It's required. And that's a word for some sanctified sister or brother sitting in this place, struggling to stay committed to God when you feel like God ain't talking to you. Your righteousness is not remarkable. It's required to walk with God. Have you ever said that to God? God, I've been serving you this long, God. I'm doing what you ask, God. I say hello to that crazy coworker. You know the one that gets on my last saved nerve. When will you honor my request? As if God needs a reminder of our record. Can I preach the text this morning? You can be righteous and still have to wait to receive. You can be priestly and still have to be patient in prayer. And you may have to suffer and still be called to serve. Now, I don't know how that sits with you this morning because many of us think that the manner in which we serve God should keep us from some of the Hades that we have to go through. Some of us think that because we come so faithfully and so often that it ought to move our prayer requests to the front of the line. And God speaks to you and to me as he spoke to Zacharias through the angel with one simple tweet. God hears and he handles. The angel, the angel, it's the angel in verse chapter, verse 13 that meets Zacharias in the temple with a message. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayers have been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. Don't move too fast. Zacharias has drawn the lot to enter the temple and present the incense. He's minding his own business with no expectation of something wonderful that can happen in his situation. And it's right there when he walks in the temple that an angel shows up. An angel calls him by name. And an angel announces your prayer has been heard. Someone in this place, that's enough to make you shout amen. That's enough to help you hold on to hope. When despite having done all that you can do, that the voice of God shows up in your life and in mine as an angel speaks to you and reminds you that God still hears our prayers. See, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it this morning. That wouldn't get so much of a response. Because sometimes we have a way with God where because we are his children, we feel that we're entitled to command his attention in our crisis. We become so accustomed to him working with us that we don't treat it like it's a privilege that he's still mindful of you and of me. But the psalmist declares in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. We don't need a priest or a preacher to go on our behalf. But the simple fact is that we can take it to God in prayer. That may not excite you this morning. That may not make you feel as if it makes a difference. But I've been delivered. Maybe you're like,
life has been squeaky clean. Maybe you spell sin with no I, but the fact that God hears me when I pray makes me want to bless him right here. Makes me want to shout hallelujah. Makes me want to glorify his name. Don't walk too fast through the text this morning because some of us think that just because we pray, that God is obligated to hear that prayer and answer it. The first thing the angel reminds Zacharias before the prophecy is told is that it's just a blessing to know that God hears his people when they pray. It's not the job you lost, but the fact that he hears you when you pray. It's not the money you have in the bank account, but just the fact that he hears you when you pray. And it's not even the fact that you bear the title that you think you've earned. It's the fact that he still hears you when you and I pray. Now, Bettina Walker said it like this. Makes no difference. What the problem? I can't go to God in prayer. Ooh, ooh, ooh. yes, I have this. Blessed assurance. I can go to God in prayer. The chorus says, I can call him when I need him. Our Father up in heaven, I can go to God in prayer. How many know you can go to God in prayer? It's, 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 it's the angel that reminds us that prayer is a privilege. That there's not a prayer that I can pray that God can't hear and handle. Let me see if I can make it plain. My wife and I are parents to three children, ages 10, 6, and 3. Yeah, ooh, pray for us. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many years are between the 10-year-old and the 3-year-old. If one has it, the other one wants it. It doesn't matter if it's Curry's or LeBron's or Kyrie's, whether an iPad or iPhone or I don't know, whether it's Skittles or Starburst. If one of them has it, they all want it. Now, often when they're looking for something to get from my wife and I, they'll start doing extra chores. They'll come around unexpected and say, Daddy, I took the garbage out. Mommy, I did all my homework. As if the blessing of what they want it's tied to their deeds that they perform. And for certain things, that is the formula. But there are some other things, there are some other blessings that they benefit from, from work they never seem to do. There are some blessings that appear so basic that they often struggle to see how it could be another way. Some blessings that they get in their life that they surely don't ask for and some blessings that they get that good chores don't pay for. In church, I've waited 37 years to finally be able to sound like my parents and say, the heat in this house, that's a blessing. The food in this refrigerator, that's a blessing. The hot water shower that you take that lasts 20 minutes long, that's a blessing. There are some things that we give them because we love them, not tied to their deeds, but tied to our love. And we serve a God that loves us so much that he gives us some things that are not tied to our deeds, that are not tied to our behavior, but tied to his love. He gives us some things that appear so basic, yet it's the biggest blessing of all. For he hears us when we pray. God hears and he handles. And I'm maturing to a point that I'm just grateful that he hears me when I pray. The angel reminds Zacharias that you don't have to wait to figure out how he's going to work it out. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, cast your cares upon him. For he cares for you. God hears us, church, when we pray second tweet the text gives is that God will use a work to show you his wonder. God will use a work to show you his wonder. Say with me, verse 18 says, and Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? 
for I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. I don't know why Zacharias thought it was beneficial to remind the angel that he's an old man and that his wife is advanced in years. But he's wise enough to, call his, to not call his wife old, but just advanced in years. He's wise, broken down and worn out, despised and discounted. People in places to perform a work in order to show you God's wonder. God uses unusual and unlikely situations. Failures that should have been fatal. Missteps that should malign you from miracle moments. Just to use a work to show you his wonder. My brother and my sister, that's where many of us get messed up because we look at what we have and put a limit on what can be done. But that's not faith and that's not God. The creative power of God is that he's able to use what is offered and made available to him to make something useful for his glory. He can take what is available, dust from the earth, in a rib from the side, and make a man and a woman something useful for his glory. God can use a word and make something happen in the beginning. God created, you fill in the blank, something useful for his glory. God can take whatever is available, an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and can turn that thing into a glorious crown, something useful for his glory. And that's not just the accounts of the Bible, that's the gospel of your life and my life too, that God can take it, whatever it may be, and make something out of it for his glory. Not convinced this morning? Trials can turn into triumphs for his glory. Illness can show up, become a witness for his glory. Burdens birthed into blessing and suffering that shifts into shouting. God will use whatever is available to him for his glory. Uh, it's amazing how many signs we sometimes need to see in order to step out on faith to trust God. It's amazing how we discredit the signs as if what God did in one instance of life doesn't connect to what he's able to do in another instance of life. How he can give you a home, yet you won't trust him for a job. How he can give you a family, yet you won't trust him with your finances. How he can give you happiness, yet you don't trust him for your health. It's amazing how many signs we need to step out on faith to trust God when God will use one situation to show you he's strong in another. Pastor, I'm finding out, as you've always told us, I'm starting to believe that life really does boil down to one question. Do you trust God? Zacharias has enough to pray about. He has enough faith to pray about it. He's got the witness of an angelic prophecy proclaiming don't be afraid, God has heard your prayer. And then the angel starts to speak the blessing. It goes like this. And your wife will bear a son. And his name will be John. And you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of, in the sight of God. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, and he will turn the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before them in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the, of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Not only does the angel show up, the angel calls Zacharias the priest by his name. Not only is the priest called by his name, but 12 times in the prophecy, the angel has introduced a conjunction to the text, an add-on to the answered prayer, a conjunction to the prophecy to suggest to Zacharias that God's going to go above what you've even asked him to do. Hear it again, and 
Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and his name will be John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of God. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will turn the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And, 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 God is able to go exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ever ask him to think according to the power that worketh within you. Zechariah, whatever it is that you prayed for, God went above it. Zechariah, whatever it is that you prayed for, God went exceedingly above it. Zechariah, whatever you've entrusted to God, God has already blessed it. The challenge of Zechariah's prayer is maybe what he's prayed for is too small for what God wants to do. Too selfish, too simple for what God desires to do. God exceeds this prayer. Maybe what Zacharias prays for is too limited and too exclusive for what God wants to do through his life. God doesn't want to just bless you to make you happy, church. He blesses you so that others can experience the blessing through you. If the prophecy is exclusive to Zacharias and Elizabeth, maybe Zacharias' response of how can this be, I'm too old, can be understood. But the angelic prophecy is not just personal, it's relational to the many, to God, and to the children of Israel. How shall I know this? I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years too. Sometimes an out of season answer from God is because he has to make places and people prepared to receive that which he has designed. Sometimes an out of season answer is because the Lord is drafting more details into the blueprint of what he would like to come for. Zacharias responds to the prophecy as if the fulfillment of the prophecy has to do with him when really it has to do with God. If you get that God hears and he handles, if you get that God will make a work for his wonder, then the last tweet for the morning is this, God will mute your mouth so you don't miss a miracle moment. God will mute your mouth just so you don't miss a miracle moment. Scripture says, and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. God will, loves us so much that he will mute your mouth so you don't miss a miracle. Tell your neighbor, you better watch your mouth. You better watch your mouth. The priest and his wife have prayed, yet felt no movement in their situation. The priest righteous, yet the request has gone unanswered. The angel appears on assignment to meet him in the temple, makes a prophetic declaration of what God's going to do, and the priest offers excuses of what is impossible because it's not in his power. I think if an angel had met me on my job, I, I think if an angel had met me in the temple, if an angel had enough good sense to call me by my first name and speak to my situation, then I ought to have enough good sense to say something better than, how shall this be? How can the one who intercedes on behalf of the people ask the question, how is this possible in a time like this? How can the one who's talking to an angel while their folk outside gathered in faith praying doubt in a time like now? The priest mistakes who he is for what shall become. The prophecy said, Zacharias and Elizabeth, you will have joy, but the blessing is beyond you. And it's funny how the one who has seen God move is the very one stuck asking the question, how shall I know? If anybody should know what's possible, it ought to be the priest. If anybody ought to know how he's able to show up and show out, it ought to be Zacharias. If anybody has walked with the Lord and seen the wonder of his work, it ought to be Zacharias. 
But since it wasn't Zacharias this morning, maybe there's somebody in this place that ought to know what God is able to do. Maybe there's somebody in the pulpit in the pew that doesn't mind giving testimony that God did it when nobody else could do it. Maybe there's somebody in the choir or in the congregation that doesn't mind testifying that God can use you for a witness, a witness for a work. And I just wanted to do a pew check this morning. I just wanted to test the temperature in this house this morning to see is there anybody in here that has seen the Lord work some situations out in your life? Is there anybody in here who's had a visit from an angel? Is there anybody in here that held on when it was easier to let go? Because God showed up in a midnight situation. I don't know if going mute was punishment or protection. But Zacharias, because sometimes we're too busy talking to see what God is actually doing in our lives. Zacharias' failing faith is causing him to miss out on the miracle he and his wife have been waiting a lifetime on. And if he's not careful, his fear of what is happening will hurt the faith of those connected to him. Can I give you a sneak preview of what happens if Gabriel doesn't mute Zacharias' mouth? If he doesn't shut Zacharias' mouth, the prophecy won't be fulfilled. If he doesn't mute Zacharias' mouth, John can't come forth. If he doesn't mute Zacharias' mouth, Elizabeth won't conceive. And John can't be delivered as the forerunner to Christ. If he doesn't mute Zacharias' mouth, Elizabeth's womb can't get filled. Her praise can't say Hail Mary. And John won't be able to do a proleptic praise in the womb because Jesus is going to be born if the, if the prophecy is unfulfilled. The majesty that's coming in the manger is so powerful and so pressing that we can't afford for Zacharias to doubt in a moment like this. The Bible reminds us in verse 10 that at the hour of incense, when the priests went in the temple, the people went to pray. Luke 1 21 lets us know that their faith is still firm, though they have not received what they petitioned for. How do I know that? Because the Bible says in Luke 1 21 that together they waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered in the temple so long. It's in the text, they fasten their faith and place their prayers in a priest who's delayed but not denied. They have not received the word, but they don't give up on the word because they have a hope of what can happen in the temple. They can't access the temple, but the priest who has the privilege of going in the temple carries the faith of those that can't get in the temple door. Don't miss this, not only the people, but Luke hasn't mentioned Elizabeth since verse 5 to 25. And the priest that should deliver good news has doubted that God could really make a miracle out of this woman. It's ironic that both Gabriel and Zacharias have similar positions. Yet in this moment, Gabriel ironically sits as the mirrored reflection to Zacharias and says, my name is Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent on assignment to you to bring you a word. Both the angel and the priest have up close experiences with God. Both are vessels to fill an assignment. But Zacharias doubts and Gabriel delivers. Gabriel mutes Zacharias because he can't be trusted with the message. He can't be trusted with the miracle. And Gabriel mutes the mouth because there are people gathered outside the temple, hanging on to hope of what's coming out of the temple doors. Not what they know, but what they hold on to hope with. They know Zacharias is old, but what they want to know is what's coming from the temple. And this Christmas, people already know the news. But what they're holding on to, church, is the hope of what comes out of this temple door. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting father and the prince of peace. Can he trust you to tell the story? We walk into Advent knowing that God hears and he happens. We walk into Advent knowing that God works to show forth his wonders. And God wants to use wonders to make a witness. And the question I have this morning is will you?